Hi, welcome to the Corridor Cast. My name is Nico, and today we are going to be joined by Stephen Seamare. Steve is our landlord, and you might be wondering, why the heck do we have our landlord on the podcast? Well, if you're not a frequent viewer of the Corridor Crew channel, well, you haven't met one of the most colorful and vibrant characters that we know. Anytime Steve shows up in a video, he steals this show. He, like, he totally takes a scene and just, he goes for days with crazy stories. Just, I don't know, the depths of that man's experience uh, far exceeds any of our own. <laughs> so kick back, relax, and let's listen to Steve tell us about the tales of growing up as an artist in Los Angeles and all the crazy people he's met along the way. He's got some good stories. It's going to be a good one. Steve, thanks for being on the podcast. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, you're a, you're a man that probably doesn't need any introduction to people that are regular viewers of the Corridor Crew channel, but for those of the for those of you out there who aren't regular viewers of the Corridor Crew channel, um, Steve is the owner of this building. And when we moved out to Los Angeles, we moved directly to this building and have never left it. Uh, so I think we have a longer landlord-tenant history than almost, <laughs> I think, more people out there. Or we have more of a history than most people out there because of, I don't know, it's just been it's been a wonderful environment. Like, you've created a very unique environment for artists here, and we are very lucky to have our paths cross with you and your philosophy as a landlord I think is is different than most other people out there um you've been very supportive of the arts you've been very supportive of us and I mean can you tell me a little bit about that like what what was your mission with setting up this building like what is your ethos with trying to you know foster this community here when I moved down to downtown Los Angeles in December of 1976 um, downtown LA was kind of like a, a wasteland for, <laughs> and there weren't a lot of artists down here. And when I moved in, there was also a lot of freedom. Um, <laughs> basically if you didn't burn the building down, the fire department didn't come around. If you didn't, um, hurt anybody, you could, you could get away with a lot of things that you can't possibly get away with now. You could just have a party with 500 people hmm. uh, on your rooftop and somehow no one managed to fall off the roof. <laughs> um, you could do a lot of things. And I always liked that freedom. As an artist myself, a painter and a filmmaker, um, I like the kind of freedom that being downtown brought me. And it was... For me at that time, it was pretty cheap rent. Um, when John Peterson, who's also an artist, and I got together and we had the opportunity to buy this building, um, we wanted artists that make art, that make movies, that make paintings and sculpture, music. We wanted those kind of people in our building. Um, that's the lifeblood of a true arts district. And you have to have obviously physical space, but it also has to be priced so that a person that rents a space downtown doesn't have to have a job where they're working that job five days a week and they only have the weekend, two days to make art. What artists need is cheap space, relatively mm -hmm. cheap space, and they need to be able to have time to create artwork. And it is that time, it is those moments, and, and Nico, you know this being a filmmaker, that you can sit around and throw ideas around. You can work on the development of a script. You can work on the development of an idea. And you need that time. And you can't be worrying about where am I going to get that money to pay that ridiculous rent. Um, nowadays, a lot of artists that live in downtown, they've got a job maybe two jobs. They're trying to make ends meet and they don't have a lot of time to go home and push the envelope with their work. They don't have a lot of time to think about the work that they're doing. Um, the work, the spaces are getting smaller and smaller and more expensive. Mm -hmm. So whereas 20 years ago, a thousand foot space might cost you $500 or $600, a thousand foot space is now $3,000 mm -hmm. for a thousand square feet and going up. So we, John Peterson and uh, myself, we wanted 
to be with people like ourselves, artists and people that were creating artwork. And we didn't want to go broke either. <laughs> I mean, we, we wanted to do what we legally had to do to create a legal artist in residence building and meet the requirements that the city told us we had to. And at the same time, we weren't interested in jacking up the rents. Uh, at least, I think we've achieved that to some degree, and we have artists still living in this building that make music, that write, that uh, make videos, that make um, uh, virtual reality programming, and I think we still have that. What, why is that that you guys wanted to build <clears throat> an artist-centric building? Uh, because the entire history of interaction I've had with you has shown that money is not the reason you're running this building. Like, why is that that you have made it such a valuable thing to yourself to make this an artist-centric building? I think that's important to our culture, to Los Angeles. Um, I think I think in your case, I think with Sam and Nico and Corridor Digital, I think um, I enjoyed seeing what you guys were creating. And I thought it was so much fun to watch. And I thought this to me is... Uh, what they're doing and what other people in this building do, it's like the forefront. It's the cutting edge of creating new imagery. And I felt that's the kind of people I want to be with. That's the kind of people I want to have living in my building. People that are constantly thinking of new ideas. And, by the way, they're having a lot of fun. <laughs> that's a chief <laughs> prerequisite in life <laughs> is having some fun and doing things. And you guys do things that I've seen that, um, it well, they're amazing. And, you know, I thought that's that's the kind of thing we need. We And, and, and not to have just people, like, for example, that make commercials. Mm -hmm. We could have people in here that are paying <clears throat> a lot more rent and and different types of people, but what's the fun in that? Yeah. I mean, I'm making a lot more money, but it's, um, it's kind of killing the culture by doing that. Um, <clears throat> so you're an artist yourself. Yes. Um, I think a lot of people watching this channel, some of them are familiar with this documentary you made, Tales of the American, but they don't know that your history goes back beyond that, that you're actually, you're a, a relatively accomplished filmmaker. You have a lot of different projects you've done. Um, and beyond just that, you've also done like art installation pieces, um, some other projects like that. Can you just tell me a little bit about who you are, <laughs> what your background is, what your history is? Well, I was born in Los Angeles. And born under the Hollywood sign, hmm. um, literally. <laughs> and um, my background is my mother was an artist and my uh, father uh, was a filmmaker. And my family goes back in the movie industry all the way back to when Cecil B. DeMille came out to Los Angeles with famous players Lasky. And uh, my family, the background of my family is they're the Westmores. Hmm. And the Westmores, um, they were like a bunch of brothers, the Westmore brothers and a father, George Westmore. And they uh, headed up um, the makeup departments and special effects uh, for all of the major studios. Um, Paramount. RKO, MGM, Fox, Universal, and they were all the brothers headed up these makeup departments. Like Purse Westmore was at Warner Brothers, did all the makeup for Warner Brothers for 30 years. Mm. And my grandfather, Ern Westmore, did the makeup. Um, he won the first uh, Oscar for makeup on a movie best picture of the year 1931 called Cimarron. Mm. And it was the first time they had ever given out the Academy <clears throat> Award to makeup. Mm. And it wasn't an Oscar either, by the way. <laughs> what was it? Os it was a silver chalice. Really? Like a Just cup. like a cup? <laughs> yeah. It wasn't until later that somebody came up with that little figure, that little gold statuette. <laughs> and, you know, Betty Davis kind of coined the, the name mm. Oscar. Do you still have the chalice? 
The family still does. Oh, yeah? Yep. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Best makeup, 1931 uh, for Cimarron. And so I grew up in a family that was uh, pretty crazy. There's Mm. a book that's been out for a number of years called The Westmores of Hollywood. Mm. And... um, they were that was truly a crazy time the 20s the 30s and the 40s uh oh, yeah. in this town oh yeah there's i mean i yeah i've heard a lot of stories my mother is an artist and she's uh primarily a painter and when i was growing up we had the craziest house on the street <laughs> it would be um i remember as a kid um in elementary school and in junior high, my mother would do lots of paintings of nude women. And mm. there were occasionally even models in our house. This actually, this reminds me of a story, not to go on too big of a tangent here, yeah. but a while back, about two years ago, we were driving to a friend's house in Marina Del Rey, and we never listened to the radio, but for some reason we turned on the radio to NPR, and you were talking on the radio. There's this moment where we're all sitting there like, wait, is that Steve? Steve on NPR? And you were telling a story about your mother, about painting a nude figure. Can you tell that story again? Sure, sure. I was going to get to that. I was kind of like laying some groundwork about <laughs> the nude paintings in our house. And my house was the kind of place where, you know, when you get out of school at three o'clock in the afternoon, you, well, I had a lot of buddies that wanted to come over to my house <laughs> and it wasn't to eat the peanut butter jelly sandwich. It was to see all the paintings of naked women around the house. <laughs> So, uh, to me, it was no big deal, but to these kids, the most exciting thing was seeing these naked women paintings. And I mean that in a Playboy magazine and you know, you're set. So, so, uh, back in the sixties, uh, yeah, that was a big deal for pubescent boys. So anyway, and it still might be, I think, you know, I don't think things have changed too much. Yeah. So in any event, um, uh, in 1966, um, we would go out to, through Malibu Canyon, and at that time period during the 60s when I was a kid, we would surf out at Point Doom and Malibu, and we lived in the San Fernando Valley, so we went through the valley, Malibu Canyon, and we had relatives that, that live at Point Doom. And at the end of the evening, at the end of a beach day, my mother would load us all up into the station wagon and drive back through Malibu Canyon and go through the Malibu Canyon tunnel. And she would look up and she would see some, a modicum of gang graffiti, and she would see all sorts of stuff on the cliff above the Malibu Canyon tunnel. And one time we even stopped there, and I had to take a leak. So she found that a very convenient place to stop. And she was looking up at the hill and little did I know what, what my mother was planning to do. But she then spent the next six months going back there to Malibu Canyon Tunnel at night and cleaning off the graffiti, chipping it off, scraping it off with a wire brush, cleaning it off. And she was preparing it like a an artist prepares a canvas Hmm. and she'd never let on to me what was going on. Why would you tell a 12 year old (laughs) that you're going to paint a 60 foot nude woman? Uh, You're not going to do that. He's going to tell the whole neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So she kept it quiet. And then by the light of a full moon on October 30th, 30th or 31st, 30th, I think, um, of 1966, She made a giant stencil and hauled it up to the top of the mountain and let it unfurl like a scroll. And it was a stencil with holes in it. And she then used a pounce to make these holes, a series of dots. And then she, once she had the figure of the nude woman holding up some flowers in its hand, in her, in her hand, uh, Mm. she then let the stencil go down. And she then proceeded to go back up to the mountain and climb down and fill it in, and she painted the Pink Lady of Malibu Canyon. Mm. And um, I do remember as a kid, right, to make the stencil, she would have to wait for us, myself and my brother, to go to sleep. 
Usually it was after Johnny Carson would come on real late at night. And then we'd go to bed because we had to get up and go to school the next day. And she would then unfurl this stencil, this huge butcher paper, brown butcher paper stencil that was 60 feet long Hmm. and 40 feet wide. And she would unfurl it across the backyard. And she would work on the stencil. And I remember one night, late at night, getting up to get a drink of water or something. And I came up out into the living room and I looked through the dining room and into the backyard and there were all these clip-on lights on stands. And there she was. She had fallen asleep and was curled up with some patio furniture asleep. She Mm -hmm. was exhausted. And I walked out and I walked onto the butcher paper stencil and there were these enormous breasts (laughs) and, 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 and a giant head and, and, and I just, um, I looked down at my mother and I said, you know, mom, what's going on? What, what is, what is all this? And she immediately woke up and said, go back to bed, go back to bed, go back. I said, mom, I, you know, I gotta, I gotta have a drink of water. No, go back to bed. Just go, go. And I, so I knew something was up. I just didn't know what it was. And then a, a couple months later is when the painting went up. And it was up for a very short period of time. Um, this in 66, you have to understand the environment in Los Angeles and in the United States was very different than it is now. It was a lot more conservative. I I would say now with, with the current president that we have in office, I wouldn't say it's any more crazier, (laughs) but it was different. It was more conservative. And in 66, you, uh, couldn't show any pubic hair, for right. example. And my mother, I think, even painted in a little bit of pubic hair on the pink lady. And they took things very differently. Um, and one of the um, c- uh, commissioners, not a city councilman, but uh, um, oh, uh, thought uh, his name was Warren Dorn. Warren and Dorn. Warren Dorn, D-O-R-N, I think. He, he felt that the pink lady was pornography. Mm. He flat out came out and said, this is pornography. And, you know, and I, th- I didn't think it was pornography. I just thought it was a nude woman with flowers in her hands. And she's not doing a lewd gesture. She's just gambling across the face of the cliff. And anyway, it was a, it was a really interesting time and it was up for a, um, four or five days. And what happened was the first thing the city said was that it's going to cause a traffic accident. The people driving through the canyon are <laughs> going to be, they're going to stare up at it and they're going to look at it. And they're going to hit the canyon wall and drive off the edge of the canyon. And yet billboards are okay. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and nobody did that. No, nobody drove off the canyon. And it was very interesting because the first thing they did was they called out the fire department and the fire department brought out hook and ladders and big, their water cannons tried to blast the paint off. But the paint was a pink Sears paint that soaked into the shale surface and it actually, the blast from the water only made the paint shinier. Oh, really? It was, it was kind of ironic. So they're just cleaning it off for you. They were just cleaning the hillside off. It was great. It made the painting (laughs) actually stand out even more. So there were porters and news cameramen and TV news was there. And it just, it just like, you know, it was everywhere. It was everywhere in the news and in newspapers and in life magazine. And Hmm. just, it was incredible what happened. And, you know, if they had the internet now, this thing would have gone viral big time because that's <laughs> kind of what it did. Uh, we have clip, we have, uh, what do you call it? Clip books with newspaper articles from almost every newspaper in the world that disappeared in this story. But at the time, um, they couldn't get it off. They couldn't figure out, they tried all sorts of things. And finally, what really pissed off my mother was that they, um, they said one night on a news program, and, and th- this, um, this county supervisor, Warren Doran, he said, if, if the man who did this will come forward and let us know what kind of paint he used so we can remove this, we won't charge him with vandalism. Mm. And my mother watching this on TV, that threw a fit. 
Yeah. Because first they assumed it was a man. Yeah. And, th- and that was the last straw for her. <laughs> so she called her lawyer and she said, meet me out. And she took me with her. And oh, she yeah. said, yeah. She took me with her and she took sketches and drawings and one big drawing that I still have. And, she's, and she called up the newspaper reporters who had done some of the stories. And she said, meet me out there. I'm going to show you something. And she did. And I was standing right there when she was surrounded by news cameras. And she said, I'm the one that painted the pink lady. And of course, at first, most people scoffed. Mm -hmm. And she said, no, here's my sketches. Here's my drawings, my preliminary, my gridded off, my big gridded off drawings to show how I did it. And she explained in detail how she did it. And um, they, and she said the kind of paint, she told them the kind of paint it was. And they weren't having any of it. By this time, Warren... They didn't believe her? Well, they just wanted it off. Warren Dorn was, you know, he, he, he just dug in his heels and thought this was pornography. So they hired an L.A. County crew to come out and also hang ropes up from the top and come down and paint it out. Mm. So they got a big airless, and guys are on there, and I've got photographs of these guys standing there on the breasts with big <laughs> shit-eating grins on their face, you know, <laughs> smiling, take, doing a photo op. I mean, I'm sure nowadays they would have the airless in one hand and the iPhone <laughs> taking a selfie in the other. So, uh, But there was, a lot of, there was a lot of action. So it, it had a very short life. And, um, you know, there were lawsuits back and forth and my mother didn't have to pay anything. And the city, uh, we sued the city for a million dollars. Really? Uh-huh. Yeah. What'd you sue the city for? Defamation of oh. a public work of art. Oh. And not only that, when the city, after they painted the pink lady over, they went back and somebody within their offices said, uh-oh, we don't own that property. Oh, no. We do not own the property or the rights to it above the tunnel. So they just vandalized the whole cliff. They buffed out <laughs> a work of art that wasn't even theirs to, to do. Oh, wow. So the judge kind of went, well, you know, he saw the city's argument, not that it was pornography, but that it could cause a possible traffic hazard. Mm-hmm. The issue of pornography or not pornography never came up in court. It was whether it was a traffic hazard. Yet they took off a work of art that was not on their property. So both cases were dismissed. Hmm. It's a fascinating story. What kind of impression of your mom did that leave you with? Oh, well, my mother was the type of person that she was, you know, go out there and do it. Don't ask permission. And that's mm-hmm. probably pervaded a lot of things I've done since I, you know, moved, became an artist. And I mean, you know, you just got to do it. You got to go out there and do it as long as it's not hurting anybody. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, there's some things that you just, you have to be um, like, for example, with this building, you have to be conscious that there's human beings living in it and you have to be as safety conscious as possible. Mm-hmm. So I'm not saying be reckless in that way. But in terms of being adventurous with your art and trying to push the envelope and trying new things, I, I'm definitely in total agreement with that. And I think my mother for a while was very much that way. And I think she just said, your job is to go out there and fuck shit up. Yeah. And, uh, she didn't use those exact words, but, but if she were still alive today, she would use those words. Hmm. And she just, you know, she was balls to the wall and go out there and do it and don't tell anybody that you can't do it, you know? And and she had people all of her life telling her, oh, no, you, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that. And she would do it, so. That's great. I mean, that's an an awesome story. And I would agree with that sentiment that you just got to go out there and do it. I mean, to me, art exists to elicit a reaction. Whatever that reaction may be depends on what the artwork is intending to do, but you know, artwork's supposed to make you feel something. It's supposed to make you react. And it sounds like you achieved, or she achieved that with the, uh, the pink lady of Malibu. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, 
it, it's something when we first moved, when I first moved to downtown on the corner of Olympic and Central Avenue, it's now a parking lot. Uh, I moved into a building that was a former brothel. Hmm. It was a 16 room hotel on the second floor. And it had been a brothel up until the 1950s. I feel like every old building in L.A. used to be a brothel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and mine even had former um, customers that lived in other hotels around me and told me stories about oh. their experiences with the women that used to live in my hotel, which were really fascinating. Hmm. Um, it, it was, uh, I, I had 16 rooms of a hotel. And one room was a living room. One room was a kitchen. I tore out, I combined two rooms together. I tore the wall up between two rooms and made it into a projection room hmm. with 16 millimeter projectors and super eight projectors and surround sound stereo. Uh, one room was an editing room, which was about the size of the room I'm in now. One room was a dark room. Hmm. One room had a table saw where I could make frames and stretch canvases. One, two rooms were storage rooms. It was party central too. <laughs> it was it was great. It was really crazy living on Olympic and Central. The things I saw were unbelievable. So you've you've seen a lot of evolution of Los Angeles and this neighborhood for that matter, the arts district. Um, you know, I feel like every time I meet you I hear a new story about what's happened here. Uh, do you have any favorites that you would like to share with us on this on this podcast? Well, there's so many, over a 40-year period, there are so many characters, um, and, uh, and quite a few of them are, are, are not with us anymore. But what, one of the things, I want to give myself a shameless plug right now, because it'll back up some of the things that I've done. Um, there are two movies. One movie is called Young Turks, and Young Turks, the movie... Uh, it's a documentary, and it w I started shooting it in 1977 and filmed, con finished it in 1982. So I shot for five years. Wow. And it basically is about 13 artists that were some of the first to move down to downtown L.A. But one of the different things about this movie is, is that I decided to intercut each interview of the artist with an interview with a bum, and I use the term bum because that was the vernacular at that time. It wasn't, the word homeless had not entered the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Right around 83, 84, people started to use the word homeless. But before then, it was a bum. You're a bum. You're a wino. You're a hobo. Might, might have been even a further throwback to mm -hmm. the 60s and 50s and 40s. But um, So the movie has interspersed interviews with bums that lived in and around us. Hmm. And I thought that was, it was crucial to show that they, them talking and their environment, because the only difference between them and us was a door. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, if you didn't hustle up some money in some way, you could be right out there with them. Hmm. And it's sort of like we all had a studio and we all knew a street person. And that street person kind of like kind of looked out for you and you looked out for him. It was kind of an interesting relationship. Huh. So that's Young Turks and that can be seen on Amazon Prime. Okay. And then the, the other documentary that I just finished is called Tales of the American, and it's about the American Hotel and Al's Bar and the surrounding arts district yeah. that is changing, going through big changes due to gentrification right now. And I saw that uh, that documentary uh, back when you were screening it down at the Downtown Independent Theater. I thought it was fantastic. It was such an interesting, oh, well-researched like chronicle of that neighborhood, and not just the, the building, but really... It, it shed a lot of light on the art scene in Los Angeles, at least in that section of the community and how it evolved, because I don't feel like Los Angeles is really known as an artist city. I mean, it's known as like a filmmaker's city, per se, and, you know, perhaps a little bit of photography and music, but not really in the more traditional artist sense. And I think that's becoming, you know, I feel like the art scene is 
stepping more and more into the front of culture here in Los Angeles, but seeing kind of the beginnings and the people that helped create it and the different like philosophies and crazy characters that were there, like really, to me at least, really shed a lot of interesting light on the neighborhood. And it was, the other thing I was really impressed by was just how well researched and documented it was. You had so many sources and so many images and I mean, you must have, you worked on it for years to put it all together. I would say from the very beginning, the first um, timeline and the first planning to the very last thing we did was almost five years. And we cut, we interviewed, oh, I think we have 490 hours of interview. That's a lot. We interviewed 149 people. Uh, we used three to five cameras that we all synced up together and were shooting. And um, usually it was three, but sometimes we got a couple extra cameras going, a couple more GoPros or some other things. And so we had a, um, to cover a lot of people. We flew to Manhattan. We flew to Connecticut. We flew and interviewed people in Tampa. We went to New Orleans and interviewed a couple people. We went up to Oakland. Um, so we went the distance to reach people that had lived in the American Hotel or had had a connection to Al's Bar. And we went to the far ends of the United States to get it. Hmm. And and after 149 interviews, we re, we felt that we had just a fraction. We had just scratched the surface of all the wonderful and crazy things that happened at the American Hotel. And the hotel, you know, it was built in 1905. And so <clears throat> it's 2019. So do the math. It's been over a hundred years that this hotel has had a lot of incredible people. We had to really dig in and go through city records, county records, state records, federal census records to uncover who lived in the hotel and go through, oh my God, hundreds, I mean hundreds of different newspapers. Hmm. And where you're sitting there in the bowels of a library with microfiche and going over story by story. And, you know, back in the day before TV and radio, uh, L.A. had like nine different newspapers putting out multiple editions a day. Hmm. So when something happened at the American Hotel, when there was a stabbing, when there was a shooting, when there was a suicide, it made the paper. Hmm. Nowadays... A stabbing or a shooting, it's got to be really spectacular to make the paper. <laughs> you yeah. Know, uh, Otherwise, it's just a little blurb online and then it, it's yeah. forgotten. Yeah. So and the Tales of the American is available on Amazon Prime also, right? It is in all digital platforms, iTunes. Are there some standout characters from... Well, there's characters that, that made the movie and characters that didn't make oh, really? the movie. Yeah, I, there's a lot of characters that I've... <laughs> Can you tell me a, a little bit about either one of those? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you about one character uh, named uh, Michael Gonzalez. Michael and, Gonzalez. And, and Michael, Michael was a kind of a unique character in that he, he was, a, uh, for his time, he was kind of a wild man and he lived in the hotel and he lived in other places around the hotel. And Michael, uh, <laughs> Michael, when he was living in the hotel, would do a lot of crazy things. And we touch upon him in the movie Tales of the American. But one of the stories I can tell you is that one day Michael on the fourth floor of the hotel, um, you know, he had his shirt off and he grabbed one of those fire hoses that's on a big <laughs> spiral of, fi of coiled up fire hose. <laughs> and he took the nozzle end and wrapped it around his waist oh, no. and then proceeded to pull it not only... He proceeded to unreel it and go through his room and out his window and jump down <laughs> with it unfurling. Oh, no. <laughs> the problem was he didn't measure. And <laughs> when he got just about 10 feet off the ground is when um, it that was the end of the fire hose. <laughs> and, and so he jerked up and the fire hose ripped up the side of his skin. Ooh, and wow. you know how thick they are? There's like yeah. an incredibly thick, rough canvas fire hose. And it just tore up the side of him. And uh, But he was kind of fearless in doing stuff like that. So he, he survived? 
He survived that. And <laughs> that. Okay. Yeah, he survived that. But, um, <clears throat> you know, and um, strangely enough, uh, he and I got along great. Really? Um, one of the sides that was his darker side was he was also sometimes on heroin. Mm. And so every once in a while I would come up into the hotel and I would hear what sounded like the brain of a donkey. Mm. And I would... I would realize that's Michael. And one time I came up and I heard this. <laughs> I heard this brain and he was outside his door on line up, lying on the ground outside his door with his room key in his hand, trying to get it into the keyhole. And he was so messed up on heroin that he just couldn't get key into the hole. <laughs> I had to let him in. But so he, he was quite a character in that way. Mike, Michael, you know, he, he's no longer with us, but, um, and it's not due to one of the crazy stories that he's no longer with us, hmm. but we had a lot of interesting characters and another interesting character I'll tell you about. There was two of them. Um, one was named and he lived at the end of this street. He lived in in a concrete, little concrete building at the end of Hunter Street. Hmm. And it was a wild and woolly place down there back in the 80s and early 90s. And there was a guy named Steve Wheat. I'm going to call him Steve Wheat. Wheat is an interesting last name. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, there was another guy named Al. And they both had a really happen in place down at the end of the street. Lots of art exhibitions, lots of openings. And apparently Steve Wheat had a girlfriend. And, uh, no, no, not Steve. Uh, Al had a girlfriend. And uh, apparently, I guess the girlfriend decided that she now wanted to be with Steve Wheat. Oh, uh-oh. Now, Al is the kind of guy that takes things into his own hands when he feels like he's being taken advantage of. Uh oh. And one day when Steve Wheat and the girlfriend were gone somewhere else, Al took a sawzall and put on a big long metal cutting blade and proceeded to go to the middle of Steve's car <laughs> and saw the car in half. Oh, wow. And I mean he went through the roof. That was the easy part. The side door panels but he got it up on blocks and he went through the chassis and the drive shaft and everything. And when Wheat got back, he, he knew who had done it. <laughs> he, somebody cut my car in half. Somebody. He, <laughs> he, Al was so pissed off. He cut Steve's car in half. Kind of a symbolic gesture, I'd say. Yeah. This is like the kind of thing where you can go to the doctor and get like your hand reattached if it get, gets cut off. Like you can go to the mechanic and have him like reattach the two halves of your car. <laughs> yeah, it was total. It was total. And um, so that was that was the that was the. Yeah, I don't think they they weren't friends after that. No, I. Yeah, that would be a bit of a. Alberto took it personally. Well, I would too if I got my car cut in half by Sam. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, it was. He was. You know, Al was really pissed. Was it a nice car? Uh, well, it certainly wasn't after. But <laughs> 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 yeah. So that was that was the kind of things that even happened on Hunter Street. That was here on Hunter Street. Right here. Mm. 150 feet from where we're sitting and right now. And you already now. owned the building then. Yes. So you were just kind of watching all this play out. Just oh, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah, you don't want to get between a man, an angry man and, a, and his sawzall. I can tell you right now. It's kind of like a chainsaw. <laughs> but uh, that, that, that was quite, a, quite an event. So there were characters like that. And I remember, um, as I mentioned before, we used to be able to get away with a lot of things that you just can't get away with now. Yeah. Um, and a lot, most of it's innocent. Most, no, but it, we, you know, it didn't hurt people. Mm -hmm. um, there were used to be a series of car dealerships on Figueroa and you would drive down and as you passed a car dealership, you would see like a giant balloon oh, is ad this? advertising. So you're telling me about characters. Now you're telling me about yourself as a character, right? Oh. Because <laughs> you're a character too, right, Steve? Well... Sometimes. <laughs> um, 
But you could also see balloons for giant gorillas or balloons for all sorts of weird inflatable balloons that are 50 feet by 100 feet that are floating above the car dealership to get people's attention. And one evening, um, my girlfriend and I were driving down Figueroa and we saw this giant balloon and it had like a little gondola basket on it and it was attached to this car dealership and I looked around and it was pretty late at night and I didn't see any police and I didn't see, and nobody at the dealership was closed and I climbed up a telephone pole and um, in true gorilla fashion I undid the entire apparatus and dropped a rope down and came down with the balloon Oh. And we attached it to my my VW. How big was this balloon? Uh thirty by thirty feet. Yeah. Whoa! It like, could you like jump extra high if you held on to oh, it? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It was filled. With, it was a hel- It was filled with helium. Okay. It wasn't. A, it, it looked like a hot air balloon, but it was actually just filled with helium. Hmm. And so. We slowly drove it all the way back to the Arts District, to the corner of Hewitt and Traction. And we knew that a lot of our friends would be in Al's bar. And on the way there, we had to pull the balloon down to get under power lines. But we got the balloon back to Hewitt and Traction, <clears throat> walked it over to the intersection there. And right there on the corner where the American Hotel is, people came out of the bar. We had a big party. We tied flares. We, I asked people to go to their cars to get road flares and we tied them on and duct taped them on Then we lit them all and we let the balloon rise up. And it was just, we had fun. It, and, you know, you had another star to the sky, huh? Yeah, it was great. We watched it till it com- the flares completely disappeared and the balloon disappeared. We don't know if they landed in some very dry field and set the whole field <laughs> on fire. We don't know if they landed in a suburban neighborhood. Well, they, whatever it was, the prevailing winds probably took the balloon out to sea and it, without hurting anybody, just went out. Like two UFO sightings that night? Yeah, yeah. It was, and so, you know, we had things like that and we had other people like uh, who's this, now I'm still alive, but uh, <laughs> there was another person that lived in the American Hotel. His name was Big Al, Big Al Watt. And he was kind of a, he was a really wild and crazy guy. And he would go up on top of the American Hotel and he would shoot off skyrockets. Skyrockets? Yeah. What's he a skyrocket? Well, it's kind of like, you know, a rocket with a dry propellant, uh, oh. like an engine that's, you know, it's a, it's. It's, it's like a model rocket. Kind of like model, but it was, it was, I guess it's like a large three foot, two foot long tube with a big stick coming out of the bottom of it and you light it and it has a nose cone and it would, he would shoot them off and Roman candles and, um, and he, and he would also do something else. He would start a few years ago before he died, he would see the neighborhood starting to gentrify Hmm. and he would see people sitting across at a cafe and he would quietly go back and he would take, uh, an M80. <laughs> uh, and they these were big. Yeah, aren't they like a, a quarter stick of dynamite or something and like that? They sound like it. <laughs> That's like the he, urban legend. He would, well, whatever it is, an M80 makes a lot of noise. And he even had ones that were big, like three-inch long tubes. Hmm. And he would light them and then chuck them out right into the street nearby where people were sitting and drinking their $4 lattes. And <laughs> $4. Yeah. That's cheap. <laughs> $4 lattes. Yeah. And he would then just start laughing like crazy, but it sounded like world war. It sounded like mortars incoming and he would just pull pranks like that. And sadly he's no longer with us either. Well, that's one way to try to keep the rent more affordable in a neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. He he didn't like the changes in the neighborhood, but um, we had characters like him. We also had um, we had Alberto Alberto Miaris, who is in the movie Tales of the American, and Alberto was uh, and he still is. Uh, he's a wonderful artist. He makes installations, makes sculptures. He welds. He made what's called the flame-throwing espresso rod, and it looked sort of like a fire truck. 
As in like a hot rod, but espresso rod. Yeah, it's okay. like a truck that looks sort of like a fire truck. Okay. And then he, on top of it, where the hook and ladder, where the ladder would be, he had a setup with a chair and an espresso machine. Hmm. And underneath, it would have a big canister of gas, and it would shoot out a 20-foot flame. Wow. So instead of, like Alberto says, instead of putting out fires, it would start fires. <laughs> and he would drive it around for one event. He drove it around in the Arts District. And I was lucky enough to be there on that, that night and actually photograph him doing that and making espresso for the crowds of people. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was pretty incredible. That's one it way was, to keep your coffee warm. Yeah, he, he, he did, and he rode around with a fire, fire hat on. And um, You couldn't do that anymore these days in that neighborhood. Our, no, our, it, you couldn't do... Uh, we did a lot of things. Again, we would go out into the neighborhood when Don Jones died. The community got together, and they sort of collectively just had a giant bonfire in mm. the middle of the street with chairs and Christmas trees and, and stuff. And it was like a Arts District Burning Man. That was a spontaneous thing that happened, and then the fire went out. But nowadays, if you were to do that, you'd have 35 people calling the police, the fire department. And you now have guys that are riding around on bicycles with little purple helmets and little purple... Safety vests. Safety vests on. And they've got walkie-talkies. And if they see somebody even on a street corner selling scarves without a permit, they immediately force them to move on or call the police. If they see a homeless person spending a little too long on a corner talking with somebody or possibly asking people for a, a, some change, they physically move them on. Hmm. You know, I call that fluff and fold. It's fluff where you fold. fluff and fold. Yeah, it's a term that the LAPD uses when you have a problem in an area and you can't really do anything about the problem because it's a big social problem. So they fluff it and fold it and move it to another area. Huh. Fluff and fold. Like your bed sheets. Just like that. And, you know, these, these guys on the bicycles that work for the business improvement district, you know, I mean, they just, all the spontaneity is gone, you know. So are you, are you sad to see the neighborhood change like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's just, um, and I think you'll live long enough to see changes too. I mean, that, I've been here 10 years now. I had right. my 10-year anniversary in December 1st of well, 2018. Well, then, then uh, you are, okay, I, I must officially say that Nico Puringer is a lifer. <laughs> when you've hit 10 years in downtown, that's a life sentence. Yeah. Yeah. You could, you could even move to a house nearby in Highland Park, Lincoln Heights. You're still a lifer. You've, you've done, you've done us, you've done your, your stretch of time in downtown. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah. I got that badge of honor now. I mean, yeah. I mean I've uh, seen big changes too, you know, right. It's from the American apparel warehouse down the street now being bought, I think by Google and it's been like renovated for the past two years and like the Soho house is like being built like right next door to it. And of course across the street is like a textile factory and across the street from that is the playpen, a fully nude strip club. So it's a weird mashup, you know, but it's changing. You want to keep the playpen there. I think so. Yeah, you definitely, yeah. because the playpen and some of these other clubs still keep an edge to what the neighborhood was, <laughs> you know. It, you know, I mean, I've never been in the playpen, but any, you know, but have you checked out that billboard? <laughs> you can't but help not check out that billboard. Yeah. Just big bucks right yeah. on the side of the street right. every time you drive by. And and that's the sign of a healthy neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, I mean, it it used to be back in the day that certain streets, like where Church and State is mm -hmm. on Mateo and Industrial mm -hmm. and Little Bear, there's, there's the, 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 those restaurants that are there. Well, that used to be one of the most... Um, it was a grungy street. Oh, it was I can imagine. It, it was Hooker Central, and there would be a lot of truckers. Um, 
yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah with, 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 the, with, with with the hookers right there on Industrial Street. It was that was ground zero for 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 that kind of business. And now it's very very sedate and it's very um, different. And and so sometimes things can be better that way because mm. there's less crime there's you know but there's still nowadays i would have to say in the last 20 years the homeless population the homeless situation has gotten much much worse really oh oh yes there's no question about it how would you try i mean i know this is a huge huge like topic but how would you try to address that situation wow that is a it, that's a multiple You'd have to attack that problem from multiple situations, but affordability of living space is what's required. If I had, if I won the lotto, if I won the lottery and won $20 million, the first thing I would do would be to, the first thing I would do, if I could buy a couple of hotels I would buy a couple of hotels, I would retrofit these, and I would have these hotels, double rooms, single rooms, whatever, and I would make sure that they were rented out to artists, to poets, to writers, to videographers, to filmmakers. I would make sure that on the ground floor there was affordable eating places, affordable places where artists could exhibit their work or show their work. I would make it so that, and I, what I mean affordable is I'm talking about like $600, $700 a month mm-hmm. for, st- for studio space. Affordable, where an artist is not constantly scrambling to make rent for a small, small, tiny studio. You know, you've got rooms that are 500, 400 square foot rooms that you can, you know, something, again, something so you have that eclectic mix of where you could go to a poetry reading in a, in a bookshop, go to a bar and have a beer and see a couple of new bands that are emerging, go next door to a gallery, uh, maybe go to a makeshift uh, place where you could show present some work, some new video work. Um, have that environment. That's what I would do. Mm-hmm. I, I would want to buy a whole bunch of buildings like that and keep it artificially, keep it low as long as I possibly could. Hmm. And just say, hey, we've got room for people that are creatives. I mean, everybody in this room. If, if, if we had that opportunity and it was, you know, available, we would do it. And that's, that is affordability. Now, let's say you're not an artist. Let's say you're just some guy that wants to work as a barista mm-hmm. or as a bartender. They still need affordability. I mean, they really need affordability because those are the guys that are serving you your coffee. Those yeah. are the guys that are actually preparing you the bacon and eggs. And, you know... I, and they've got it. They can't be driving from Rancho Cucamonga or San Bernardino to come here to do that. Yeah, they've got to be living in our community. I think the laws need to specifically state that if an if a person is going to develop a building, they need to give up a a significant percentage, ten percent minimum, to people with incomes that are lower than the average income. You need to have be able to have a, um, well, I just listed it. You need to have that. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you're, you're just, you, you don't, you don't, even police officers, even firefighters need to feel those kind of service people. They need to live in the community they protect. Yeah. Because then you're connected to it. Right. And if a police officer lives in Simi Valley, but he's got to drive all the way to work to police downtown, he has no connection to it. In fact, he probably hates it. He hates the commute in. He then hates the environment he's in. <laughs> and then he hates the commute home. And if he's living down here and he can actually, when he's not being a police officer, walk down the street, get a beer, talk to the people, talk to the, see the art scene as it is, that's important. So th- it's, it's a very complex question. But the bottom line is affordability. 
I mean, for for a quick answer, that was a pretty good answer, I thought. You got to be able to live and you got to yeah. be able to eat at reasonable prices. It's like one of the places that I talk about, uh, uh, we were just talking about it the other day, was Philippe's, Felipe's mm, up yeah. on North Main. I mean, you can go in there and you can still get a cup of coffee for 47 cents. And damn, it's coffee. <laughs> you know? Boy, is it coffee. <laughs> yeah, 47 cents. And a refill is. Unfortunately, 47 cents. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel like I can live with that. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, you know, that yeah. was a lot of really interesting stories and interesting perspectives on things. And I, th I think it's really cool that you, you maintain your, you maintain your principles and your ethics and your ethos with what you do in life. And I feel like that leads to a happier life because there's a point where you can, you can take your time and your efforts, and you can put that towards money. You can try to make more income with that. But there's a certain point where happiness doesn't come from that, and it comes from doing the things that you think are important. And I feel like out of a lot of different people I've met, I feel like you're one of the people that have made that a priority in their life to pursue the things that are important to them. And I think it shows in in the passion for the things that you do and the happiness that you have with the things that you do. I think in the, in the vibrancy that I guess you approach your life with. I mean, at least that's what I, from my from my interactions with you, that's what I've gathered. Um, well, I, I, I feel that I, th I think that's a good way to live. I felt the driving force behind doing Tales of the American and interviewing 149 people who lived there or had a connection to it was simply this. Um, there's a lot of amazing events that occurred in that hotel, uh, both in my life and in lots of other people's lives, whether it was... Uh, the African-American people that lived there in that hotel first and the Japanese people that lived there and made a life and then were yanked out because of a racist decision to <laughs> to tear away their their homes and their businesses and put them in concentration camps, to the artists that moved there and uh, made paintings and drawings and music. And I felt that if there was not someone there to actually put their stories down, all of those stories would disappear. Um, like uh, Rutger Hauer says in that last scene in Blade Runner, they would just disappear like tears in rain. <laughs> and that's a fact. If you don't capture those stories and put them together, it's all hearsay. And then when I die and you die, and then the stories disappear. And I'm sure that this is nothing unusual. I'm sure there's been billions, literally billions of interesting stories, but they've, if they haven't been captured and painted and recorded on film or are in, uh, in a song, they're gone. Mm -hmm. And no one has an opportunity to see those stories or hear them. And, uh, you know, it wasn't like, believe me, we didn't think we were going to make a pile of money <laughs> by doing a documentary. Um, and we haven't, <laughs> but we have got we have got a lot of exposure and a lot of people. In fact, there's an upcoming show that is being organized right now by a, a professor, uh, an art professor named Tom O'Day up in uh, Spokane College, and he's putting together an exhibition called Tales of the American, hmm. and it will show. Actually, it will show. Clips that will show the movie constantly, and it will have a lot of art in the gallery from artists that lived in the hotel and music from musicians, and they're doing a whole book catalog on, on the movie and, and the exhibition itself. So it will live on, and I think that's what's important. One of the other things that occurred downtown was a series of events that uh, myself and a few other people put on together. We got together and we decided it around 1990 to have a, uh, a show called The Red Zone. The Red Zone. Yeah. Now, what The Red Zone was, was we decided, you know, we don't need no stinking permits. We don't <laughs> need to ask permission. And we didn't. And the first Red Zone was directly across the street of the American Hotel. And it, it was a building that is now called Verst Kuka, which oh, is a yeah. sausage and beer place. Well, back in the day, back in the day, that was a hotel. And it was called the Keystone Hotel, and it was multi-storied, and a couple of the floors burned down, 
and they literally tore down those stories, and the ground floor is still the bottom of the Keystone Hotel. And for many years, a printer occupied that ground floor with big printing presses and machines. And when we would be sitting over there having a beer over at the American, we'd look over, and every Friday, the guy, the little old man that ran the printing shop, would get in his car and drive off and go home and not return till Monday morning. Mm -hmm. And so around this time, we said, let's do the first red zone right up against his whole building. Hmm. So on a Friday, we watched for that little man to get into his car. He locked up his door, got in and drove off. And then all of us, about 10 or 15 people, got together with big five-gallon buckets of red paint, fire engine bright red paint. Hmm. And with rollers in hand, we painted his entire building from the <laughs> ground to the rooftop on all sides bright red. Wow. And we had a big stencil that was made that said, Red Zone, Art Above the Law. And myself, I did an artwork where I had a, I had a silhouette of myself made of meat that I used concrete nails, and I made a silhouette of myself in meat on the wall. Skip Arnold completely naked, wrapped himself in saran wrap about around a nearby telephone pole. Other artists hung paintings. Uh, Liz Young, who's a sculptor, she is still making work in Los Angeles. She decided to tar and feather herself and put herself in a cage on the sidewalk. Mm. Other people did performances. We went around and we did posters all around the entire arts district for this show. We took trash cans, filled them with ice, loaded them with cases of beer, and gave away beer. Wow. Now, you can have a really popular place when you give away beer. And we had roughly, uh, by the end of the evening, we had, well, not by the end of the, by, by about 9 o'clock at night, we had 2,000 people. Wow. And it was so incredible. The opening was so incredible that uh, Councilman Mike Wu showed up, and he loved it. Hmm. He came up and talked to me and he talked to everybody and he went, wow, this is really great. And I'm glad he was there because then the police showed up. <laughs> many, many police cars showed up and they wanted to know who's, who's putting this show on. And, and I just, they came up to me and I said, oh, I don't know. He's over there. He, he <laughs> you know, he's over there, I think. And, and I, I did not want to be pegged as the organizer of the red zones, um, and they would just say, well, who's running this? And I would go, I, I don't know. I think the guy's over there. You know, <laughs> and so there was 2000 people. But Mike Wu put an end to it. He said, no, this is really great. Everything is fine. Um, and by that time, by the time the police arrived, most of the beer had been consumed. Mm. But still, there was an, an amazing amount of people. They had a great time. And we would do things like that. We would just take over a place. No permission. No permits, no porta potties. If you had to go to the bathroom, you better find an alcove or, <laughs> or somebody's studio or something. But we didn't do any of that nonsense that everybody has to. Oh, oh, and take out a big insurance policy, you know, to cover it, a liability policy, which is what they want. Um, yeah, we didn't do that. And we had seven red zones. You had seven of them. Seven. Wow. We would just go to a building and open it up that was abandoned. And just, we would go to the railroad tracks right where the railroad, you know, the parking space is underneath the 4th Street Bridge. So mm -hmm. we, that's what it was like. Mm. And so those were the red zones. And that's the kind of way it was then. And Modern Wild West. Yeah, it was, you know, it, it, and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> well, Steve, you're always filled with awesome stories and crazy experiences, and I appreciate you coming here to share with everybody and tell us a little bit about what makes you you and what makes this part of Los Angeles what it is. Um, you know, why we are able to do what we do here at Corridor Digital is in part due to the environment, you, the environment that you've helped create for us. Um, and I feel like a lot of our just get out there and do it attitude with our video shooting um, I think mirrors a lot of the experiences you've had with your artwork that you've done as well. So thank you again for appearing on the Corridor cast. Uh, and just a reminder to everybody, Tales of the American is on Amazon Prime, as is Young Turks. Go ahead and go check it out. It's an excellent documentary. Um, I vouch for it myself. <laughs>
And yeah, is there any any parting message you want to give to all the artists and filmmakers out there trying to make it happen? Yeah, um, just keep, you know, push the envelope. Try something you haven't done before. Um, try, you know, material that's funny. Try material that's dark. Um, try to be entertaining, but at the same time, make them think about what they're looking at and the environment that, that we live in. Cool. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Steve. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So that concludes our podcast here with Stephen C. Mayer, the landlord, the artist, the filmmaker, the crazy guy that tells us all these cool stories and knows a lot of cool people. If you guys aren't subscribed to the Corridor Cast channel on YouTube, please consider doing so. Uh, we have a lot of cool excerpts that we post from our podcast, as well as video portions that accompany the audio. Uh, if you're listening on other platforms, that's really awesome, too. So I appreciate all of you guys listening. Uh, stay tuned because we got more crazy guests on the way. 2019 is going to be a good year with some good content. All right. So long, everybody.